Good evening, everyone here and everyone at home. Thank you for joining us in celebrating the MacGuffin's 40th anniversary. I'm Brett Griffiths, and as of this year, I am the new faculty editor of the MacGuffin. I have some really big shoes to fill. So in the last couple of years, we've had Kathleen McClung, who you'll hear read in a few moments, and she really helps to usher our staff, um, a new reading crew, uh, through the pandemic and continue to keep this magazine going. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, before Kathleen, we had Steve Dolgen, who's faculty editor, and prior to that, Art Lindenberg. In 1984, Art Lindenberg was tasked with starting a literary journal. There were many conversations about what shape that journal might take, but Art was really smart in the way he approached this project. He knew that Schoolcraft had had a couple of attempts at literary journals that had you know, come for a couple of years and gone for a couple of years. And he said, yes, but it has to be a national journal and I have to have some support from the college. And 40 years later, we still have a national literary magazine. So recognized, in fact, that there are people in Kansas City and San Francisco and Boston and actually in other countries who are receiving copies of this journal three times a year. That's pretty amazing, I think. Before I say a couple more words, I do want to say that this reading is made possible by the Schoolcraft Foundation, um, Don Regretta and, Don, and, and Denise Weidman, who uh, really run a wonderful ship and keep so many wonderful activities happening at Schoolcraft. And so I want to do a quick shout out to them. Dr. Glenn, Dr. Glenn Cerny, who um, supports so many of the arts and humanities events, as well as the culinary and the other activities at Schoolcraft. Dr. Stacy Whitten, and here tonight, Dr. Michelle Kelly, who's the Dean of Liberal Arts and a fierce guardian of humanities and arts, not only at Schoolcraft, but also in our community. Where are you, Michelle? When people ask me, why a literary magazine? Why do they matter? What are they? I've never heard of the MacGuffin. I say, have you ever taken a literature class? Have you ever read Dickens? Have you ever read Lorca? Have you ever read Rilke? All of those writers were published in small serial journals, newspapers, and literary magazines before they were anthologized. Nobody just wakes up and gets put in an anthology. It takes a lot of time, and there are so many people behind the scenes that are reading and supporting new writers and bringing new literature into the world, and that's what the MacGuffin does. Specifically, I'd like to take a moment to recognize uh, our editorial staff of readers. We have several people who meet about 25 times a year to discuss submissions to the MacGuffin. If you want to have an idea of what those submissions are, we have over 600 submissions in poetry, about 500 in fiction. And if you imagine each of those poetry submissions has four or five poems in it, it's something like 2,700 poems and 500 short stories, each of which may go from five to 14 pages. From that, they read, they recommend moving some items forward, making decisions about what should be published in the MacGuffin. That means about 8% of everything that we receive winds up in the pages that you see and receive in your mail. The staff does this on a volunteer basis. They read on their own, in their homes, they attend meetings religiously, on time, and with dedication. And so while some of them are here tonight, I'm going to ask those of you who are here when your name is called, I'd like you to stand, please. And for those who aren't here, I know you're watching at home, so I just want you to know that we're giving you a shout out here. Kaylee, Kaylee Lecheco, Zeke McClure, Nico Iani, Kelly Riddle, Mike Dyke, Holden Davies, Melissa Converse, Amy Barnes, Ellen Woods. These are our pro staff readers. Can you please stand, those of you who are here? We also have a team of poetry readers, which include Kathleen McClung, who you'll hear read in a little while. 
Kathleen McClung, Alex Morgan, Robert Eastman, Kevin Griffin, Mitch Van Acker, Angie Minkin, and Roberta Brown. Can you stand if you're here? Our readers are also national. So while we have a core group of readers here in Michigan, we also have readers around the country. Um, so as I said, they are watching through our YouTube streaming live. Um, I, I mentioned that Art Lindenberg founded this journal in 1984. And Art planned to be here tonight, but um, due to a personal issue that arose just shortly before the reading, he will not be here. We're going to try to stream him in at the very end for a couple of final comments. But I do want to just say that it was really Art's labor of love and his incredible dedication that got this journal to be sustainable and read nationally. So thank you, Art. Finally, I want to recognize one other person who a lot of you know, but maybe it doesn't always get immediately recognized. Um, whenever we read something, whenever we see great art, when we go to a museum and we see the wonderful paintings on the walls, when we receive our glossy, gorgeous issue of the MacGuffin with all of the fonts perfect and the spacing perfect and not a letter out of place that has been meticulously read over and over and placed authors next to each other in conversations that make us think in new ways, that work is all done by Gordon Krupski. Gordon is the managing editor of not only the MacGuffin, but the Community College Enterprise. He oversees both journals um, as a part-time employee at Schoolcraft. And when all of us shuttered our doors and went home and couldn't go to work and we were basking and bleaching our groceries, Gordon was doing a national search to find readers who could get on Zoom setting up a way to take digital subscriptions and to take digital submissions and converting, converting the entire magazine into an online accessible format so that we wouldn't miss a step. His work has been Herculean. Can we do one more round of applause for Gordon? And Gordon, because really this is your baby, I think you should get up here and introduce some poets. Hello. Good to see you all. Uh, I am Gordon Krupski. I am the managing editor here. Uh, most of you know me as the guy that sends all the rejection letters. Uh, people love me out there. I um, want to say a real quick hello on the stream there to Patrick Wilcox, who I'm sure is watching at home in Kansas City tonight. Uh, Patrick has been to like every live stream we've ever done, so I can only imagine he's here right now. Um, all right, well, let's get, uh, let's get going here. I want to set the scene for everybody today. So picture it. It's a, it's a dark and stormy Wednesday afternoon. The rain is falling. The tornado sirens are sirening. It's very, it's very spooky outside. There are, there are a lot of writers and poets gathered in one room. And you can tell because it smells like wine everywhere. Um, and, and why are they here? It's a real MacGuffin, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, the literary device originating in Victorian England and popularized by Alfred Hitchcock. I'm talking about the very fine literary magazine that we all know and love, The MacGuffin. Um, we actually have the very first issue right here, y'all. Uh, back from 1984, 40 years ago, um, this, is, this is the one that started it all. Um, very, <laughs> very, very rudimentary, like compared to our current one. No, no color pictures in this guy. Um, actually, I just had someone looking for a copy of this two days ago. I got an email, and they were like, are you sure you guys are 40? I'm pretty sure you guys came out in 82. And I'm just like, nah, I'm looking at looking at number one right here, and it's 84. So these people are still out there, still kicking, and so is this magazine. So let's let's give it up one more time for the MacGuffin and Art Lindenberg's thing right here. Uh, I feel very blessed to be able to introduce our first reader tonight, uh, our 
our, our former editor, Kathleen McClung over here, the most excited person about writing and poetry and especially the AWP conference that I've ever met. Um, Kathleen just like bleeds poetry and just goodwill to her common man. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy that she could make her Michigan debut tonight here. She's, she's so excited about life. She's even excited about being in Livonia. So, I mean, come on. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Kathleen here. Kathleen is the author of four collections of poetry, A Juror Must Fold In On Herself, which I believe you might have available tonight if anyone's interested in buying a copy. Uh, also, Temporary Kin, The Typist's Play Monopoly, and Almost the Rowboat. Her poetry, memoir, and fiction appear widely in journals and anthologies, uh, including Atlanta Review, The Healing Muse, California Quarterly, and a whole host of others. Uh, uh, please welcome to the stage, the lady herself, Kathleen McClung! Thanks so much, Gordon. I have to say, working with Gordon Krupski during the COVID pandemic was the best experience um, professionally and creatively that I had. And um, he, Brett referred to his tasks as Herculean. I would say he was heroic in keeping the MacGuffin alive and well and thriving. And he is what I consider an essential worker. And it was a joy to work with Gordon. So one more round of applause for Gordon Krupski. Um, I'm going to start out my reading kind of on the lighter side and share with you some exciting news, which is I have a new book of poetry coming out in the fall um, from Longship Press. I just signed the contract about a week ago. Uh, the book is called Questions of Buoyancy, and many of the poems were written pre-pandemic, and then some of the poems were written during the pandemic. And this is sort of a light-hearted poem written during the pandemic. It's a sonnet, and the title is, To the handsome young fireman chopping it up on the sidewalk outside the cafe. You see me cross Arguello Street, and lust, or something close to it, rears up in me with every step I take. I'm sure you must provoke it all the time, no mystery. My sandal nicks the curb. Preoccupied, I trip and fall. I only scrape my knee, but worse, this purple bruising of my pride. Yeah, yeah, quotidian catastrophe. No burning of a house, no smoke, no flames. Just woman sailing through the air instead of trading repartee with guys whose names are surely Josh, Luke, Brandon, Chris. Ahead, disasters lurk. Right now, though, I'm OK. No problem. Nothing broke. Please, go away. I'm going to switch the mood a little bit, or a lot, by reading from my book, The Typist Play Monopoly. Um, we're living in conflictual times, um, and it's not the first round of conflictual times. I think conflict is part of our human race. And my mother told me stories about living during the, the Cold War and living during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1963, when I was a little kid, a little toddler. And I remember these stories very vividly. So this poem is a sestina, and it's called My Mother's Cold War. You changed the channels on the black and white, but talk of missiles did not end. Grim men with maps of Cuba, Florida, the Keys, intoned all day, had magnified despair. A stroke had palsied Grandpa Mark the year before, his walk a shuffle, 
and baseball chatter his words. Watch him now. Keep your eye on him. Eight words were all I ever heard him say for years. His white hair neatly combed, his gray slacks pressed, and four quick dabs, old spice, on cheeks and neck. Old men moved slow, I knew back then, but most made sense. His stroke, a mystery to me, a lock whose keys got lost before my birth, that is, if keys had ever truly fit. You said at two, I coined more words, more sentences than he. And tender women stroked my head at Lucky Market, shoppers, white and black, carts crammed with steaks, canned peas, women like you, afraid, determined, stocking up before the missiles launched, rose, arced, and fell, before grave captains on board submarines turned keys releasing bigger bombs, before all men and women perished from the earth. Some words did give you comfort, mother, in your white kitchen those autumn days. Perhaps the strokes you made yourself with Bic ballpoint, small strokes, secrets in Greg shorthand, or songs you'd heard before by Nat King Cole. Did your head throb with the fridge's white noise hum? You said I chewed and praised my plastic keys, red, jello, green, pink, blue. Perhaps my words soothed you, lullaby in reverse, while men's low voices murmured on TV. Newsmen, clean cut, articulate, unscathed by stroke. October 1962, all of their words intact and whole and horrible. Before the crisis calmed, I wonder if you weighed your keys, weighed idling the Ford behind closed white garage door, drowsy passengers speaking few words, man dulled by stroke, toddler in white nightgown, but aisles of lucky ladies knew our names, waited for us. Let's work for peace, y'all. Let's work for peace. Um, this next poem I'm going to read is, is a sonnet. And um, y'all may remember in 1989, we had a big earthquake in San Francisco. And this is a poem dedicated to the one person who died driving across the Bay Bridge when the bridge cracked during the earthquake. It's called The Driver's Earthquake. Dedicated to Anamafi Mawala Kalushia, 1966 to 1989. It's a sonnet. My words could sing Pretend my words survive the quake, live past October, promises to keep or break. Pretend I do not drive to meet my brother's plane, withhold kisses instead until he knocks on our front door. My words could serenade others as well, the nurses where I work, cashiers in stores, my husband, most of all. Pretend we tell our children how we met. Pretend they're born. No, tell the truth. I drove across the bay, I met his plane, and concrete cracked. They mourn for me, the kin I left behind. They say my name, Anna. Remember how I spoke and sang soprano, how a bridge in autumn broke. Thank 
you. I'd like to read a couple of poems from my chapbook, A Juror Must Fold In on Herself, which grew out of my experience serving as a forewoman on a uh, vehicular manslaughter case a few years before COVID. It was a very, very challenging case. A child was killed by a driver as she and her family were crossing the street. So I'm going to read the opening poem in the chapbook which is an abecedarian, meaning the first line begins with A, and then the second with B, all the way through Z at the end. This is called Field Notes, Hall of Justice, Parking Lot. Already nearly full with early birds, the parking lot on Bryant comforts me. Bland rituals, square stub on my dashboard, new numerals each day, gruff employee beckoning almost imperceptibly to the first available space. And yes, every morning I glimpse the defendant in his tie, arriving on his bike across the street, locking it with a gigantic U to the Hall of Justice rack, the only bike. He may know I watch him, Linger in my reliable car, CD of Mozart etudes spinning, spinning. No contact is permitted, no words or gestures or notes on yellow sheets ripped from legal pads. I keep all of my questions to myself. I am no renegade juror, will not be smashing the system this summer. The judge explained contempt of court to us. It sounded ominous. I was already spending my vacation in a crummy swivel chair. Why prolong the ordeal, committing the extreme offense of asking a cyclist, how are you holding up? Have you found a zone of peace? I watch him instead, Mozart wailing. And this poem is the very first poem I wrote after finishing that ordeal of being on the jury. It was really hard to not talk about being on the jury. Um, my partner Tom got really sick of hearing me talk about it for weeks after we finished the trial. And then I wrote this poem as kind of my way to start healing from the experience. Uh, it's in three parts. It's called The Juror's Lament. Part one, box. We must not speak, return to scene of crime, bleak dive bar street, or worse, research online the cast of players in this cheerless room. Plump sneaker judge instructing us, assume no guilt for now. She looks like Gertrude Stein. Stern prosecutor, watchful like a mime. Public defender, sleek in Calvin Klein. Accused, a table, silent as a tomb. We must not speak, but pay 15 to park. Arrive at nine, inch through antique metal detector line, and take our seats inside this box. Resume our stony faces, doused in dull perfume of civic duty, steno pads. Confined, we must not speak. To locked hallway. A smaller room awaits us twelve who wordlessly observed from swivel chairs. We heard this case, murky surveillance video, paid expert witnesses who swore they know who did it, how, and why. So much has blurred these weeks within our box. We have endured the bloody photographs, the vague, absurd insinuations. Now it's time to go. A smaller room will house our conversation, long deferred while lawyers spun their tales of what occurred in winter, 803, four years ago. We shuffle down a hall, reluctant row of citizens. If we convict, he is assured a smaller room. 
3 verdict. I print guilty with ballpoint pen and sign my name. Below, I add the date and time from Melvin's phone, 11.43. We've made our peace. We wrestled mightily for days, the bailiff locking us at nine, the grim defendant on hall bench, a signed or self-imposed vigil as anodyne. His presence brought us no tranquility. I print guilty, relieved to finish, stand and leave behind the awful pad marked juror six, blue lines, thin horizontal bars, a penitentiary. Success are reaching unanimity? Perhaps the punishment our judge defines. I print guilty. Um, I think I'm going to read two more poems, if that's okay with time. Okay. Um, these last two I'm going to read are from my chapbook, Temporary Kin, which came out in 2020, just before the world shut down. We had the launch party for this book on Super Bowl Sunday when the San Francisco 49ers were playing in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so there were people at my party, but everybody was sort of checking their phones <laughs> throughout the party. Um, these two poems I'm going to read are both villanelles. This one is a, it's, a, it's a persona poem. I like to write persona poems, imagining what other people's lives are like. So this poem is called, Imagining Mrs. R, who died at 114, according to her obituary. My husband died in 1963. He sold insurance, auto, fire, life. Before we met, I taught geometry, nursed ginger ales in Newark speakeasies. Bent-elbowed friends recruited me to drive. My husband died in 1963, his second heart attack, and Kennedy was shot. The black convertible, as if a knife, bisected Dallas sky. I had taught geometry, chalked arcs and angles, spheres and symmetry, but axioms dissolved when I became a wife. My husband's death in 1963 did little to resuscitate the free thinker I'd been. Arthritis would arrive before too long. I'd loved geometry and Chaplin's silent films, Rudy Valley. I knew each verse by heart as time goes by. My husband died in 1963. Before we met, I loved geometry. It's been a joy reading for you, and I'm excited to hear Barbara Crooker, and I'm going to end with one more villanelle from Temporary Kin. Um, the first poem I started with was about nicking my sandal on the sidewalk. Um, I did a lot of walking on the sidewalk during COVID, and this poem that I'm going to end with is also about being on the sidewalk, waiting to cross the street. It's called, For the Young Man Unimpressed with the Sky. It's just the moon, he shrugs, blasé, this teen. His mother, stirred like me, does not agree. We strangers gaze transfixed. The light turns green as we step off the curb and walk between these yellow lines. Familiar mystery, it's just the moon of course, but full. We've seen its sliver in the sky, known its routine each month, a moving toward immensity. We strangers gaze in awe. The light turns green, Sixth Avenue seems safe to cross if screens are off in every car, no guarantee. It's just the moon, 
just solstice. No machine that waits for us to cross can ever mean what full moon in a winter sky does. Constancy. We strangers gaze, grateful for light, for green, for seasons, cycles, wheels that spin unseen far longer than our brief mortality. It's just the moon. You're right. You're 17. We strangers praise it, though. The light turns green. Thank you. One down, uh, one to go. <laughs> I'd like to uh, give one more shout out uh, before we bring Barbara Kirker up here. Uh, uh, Brett mentioned the national search for staffers um, once we get to 2020, but I feel the need to give a shout out to someone who stuck around uh, before that search actually happened, and that is longtime poetry editor Carol Waz up here, uh, who was in the midst of retiring from staff and hung around and really saved our asses there taking care of the poetry. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we're going to bring up Barbara Crooker. Barbara uh, may be the only one here tonight who has seen me without a beard, uh, she reminded me. So that's incredibly embarrassing for me. Um, Barbara is also, uh, one of the reasons we have Barbara here today is she just judged our poet hunt contest last year, and it was actually the the largest entered contest we've had since like the early 2000s. I was checking the numbers today. We we got even more submissions for Barbara than we did for Phil Levine back in the day. So quite a feat, quite a feat. Uh, a little bit about Barbara here. Uh, Barbara is a poet from Fogelsville, Pennsylvania, um, and is an enthusiastic reader and enjoyed writing and illustrated stories in notebooks when she was growing up. In high school, she was the writer and editor for her school's newspaper. She received a bachelor's degree in English from Rutgers in New Jersey and then went on to complete her postgrad studies at Elmira College in New York. Uh, closing out the reading today is Barbara Kruger, everybody. Let's hear it. If I aim this down, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So I, I judged the poet hunt, and we found one. Hey! <laughs> I also want to give a shout out to Carol. Um, okay, so it was 25 years. Not only was she always gracious when she accepted a poem, but there was a time when she rejected my batch. I mean, this happens. And she wrote a note that said, please don't think we don't love your work. We do. Just send us some next time. Nobody else ever did that. So. so I picked, I'm only reading you poems that have appeared in the MacGuffin. I could be reading to you for an hour, <laughs> but I'm selecting them. <laughs> really, I mean, there were that many that have appeared all the years. And I forget the first year. Uh, someone would have to look that up. I don't know. So that is what I'm going to do. Um, this one, if, if, we, if we were allowed to have great hits, this one is generally a crowd pleaser, and you'll see why. And I will say that it's sort of a heretical poem for a Pennsylvania poet. I live near Hershey, which is full of milk chocolate. <laughs> Ode to chocolate. I hate milk chocolate. Don't want clouds of cream diluting the dark night sky. Don't want pralines or raisins rubble in this smooth plateau. I like my coffee black, my beer from Germany, wine from Burgundy, the darker, the better. I like my heroes, complicated and brooding, James Dean in oil leather, leaning on a motorcycle. You know the color. 
Oh, chocolate, from the spice bazaars of Africa, hauled in mills, beaten, pressed in bars, the cold slab of a cave's interior when all the stars have gone to sleep. Chocolate strolls up to the microphone and plays jazz at midnight, the low, slow notes of a bass clarinet. Chocolate saunters down the runway, slouches in quaint boutiques. Its style is je ne sais quoi. Chocolate stays up late and gambles, likes roulette, always bets on the noir. Now, I do a lot of ekphrastic poetry, and all that is is a big, fat Greek word that means poetry that has a conversation with a painting. And this one that appeared in the MacGuffin is one of my favorites. And if anybody wants to whip out their phones and go to Google Images to see the painting right now, I don't care. Go ahead. Um, you know, but these things are readily available. So this is the title of the poem is the title of the painting, The Open Window, by Henri Matisse. I walk into this room like it's an open-air market. Shutters, slabs of salmon baking on their terracotta bricks, window panes, peach and melon, trellis, slashes of mustard and olive. Out of the frame, boats sway on a candy sea, the marshmallow sky sticky behind it, the horizon stained with juice. In the pots in the foreground, Peppers sizzle and burn. Step back into the room, love, and close the shutters. The walls are really cool and white. Come out of the heat of the day, the dazzling sun. There are just the two of us here. No telephones, watches, deadlines. And we can make the afternoon stretch behind the closed slats on the smooth iron sheets. The outside world clatters away, traffics and klaxons, the blazing, blaring of horns. The sun sees behind the shutters, edible, volatile. And just so that, you know, poetry can come from anywhere. So someone gave me a book that she had gotten at a used bookstore, and in it was this little slip of paper that had this note on it. And, and the note said, meet me by the sea again. And my friend Joan, who gave me the book, said, take this little slip. You can do something with it. OK, so this is something in rhyme, which I don't normally do. Meet me by the sea again, my one true love in mist and rain, where waves are hissing on the sand, where salt dissolves the spray's descent. Meet me where the sand's hard packed, the muck and suck the shells whose backs resemble wings or spiral stairs that lead to rooms where no one's there. Meet me where the tide retreats. Meet me by the watery streets where sanderlings and plovers' wings stitch up the sand embroidering. So sit beside me on the dunes and let the east wind sing its tunes. For all too soon our time is done and one of us will sleep alone. And then this one is lighter. So I actually, this is my second time in Michigan this week. <laughs> I have been in, in Grand Rapids at the Festival of Faith and Writing. And when I was there the last time they held this festival six years ago, um, I was on a panel. One of my friends proposed a panel on writing about joy. And I don't know if any of you have small children but saw the Disney Pixar movie Inside Out, but the character Joy had blue hair. And so I said, Anya, if this panel makes and we get to do it, I'm going to dye my hair blue <laughs> in honor of this. And so I got blue hair extensions. And they were really, they were really fun, except that uh, they were nicer hair than my own hair. And they took <laughs> so long to dry, I got rid of them afterwards. But this is about that. <laughs> Extensions. I am in love with my blue hair. Think I'm a macaw. Feathers flapping at the ends. It's part of me. I take it everywhere. 
It makes me feel like a poem by Baudelaire, a bit surreal yet aligned with current trends. I am in love, my sky blue hair. Even TSA agents stop and stare. Say, you go girl. No, I'm not low end. It's part of me. I flash it everywhere, even to land's end, then a stare. I get comments both from strangers and from friends. I am in love with my true blue hair. At a cafe sipping crisp sancerre, or in a crowded bar in Old South Bend, it's part of me. I take it everywhere. Even though eyes roll by those more doctrinaire, for whom hippies at 70 surely doth offend, I am in love with my wild blue hair. I take it with me, flaunt it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun, while it lasted. <laughs> and I, I think this one maybe appeared in the... Um, the form, there was an issue on formal poetry. I don't quite remember. But this is an acrostic, so it's not something I normally do. The title is Dear at Twilight, and so Dear at Twilight reads down the left-hand side. Dim half-light, the orchard exhaling its last breath as evening makes all colors equal. Reds, blues, greens, now shades of gray. And here come the deer tiptoeing down the trail, hesitant, tentative, ready to bolt, flick their white tails, disappear in the hedgerow. This is summer's end, leaves flaring red and gold, and the garden is dwindling as days grow shorter. Whose name do we hear in the slow tones the owl calls to its mate in the thickening dusk? Deer are the evil enemy. Just saying, because <laughs> I'm a gardener. So um, I'm now going to read a, a small grouping of, um, they allowed the judge for the poet hunt to um, send five poems that, that they printed, uh, a nice little grouping. And um, I'm, one of them I can't read. And these four are going to be hard to read. I lost my husband three years ago. Canoeing. We stopped as we grew older. Three of our four shoulders needed repairs, selling our green canoe reluctantly to the man who did the tile work for the kitchen backsplash. Give me a summer afternoon, and I'm back there, floating with the current, then paddling upstream in a small bayou where the green canopy kept us hidden. And oh, yes, we were young then, I slipped out of my shorts, and we rocked that boat without falling in. The smell of mud and river water. Great blue herons silently stalking small fish. A snapping turtle that seemed dead but hissed back to life, breaking the branch we gently poked him with. We never counted up the miles. Now you're gone, set off for the farther shore, the one where I hope to join you one day. Once we set out just as the full moon was rising, it slipped from the cover of clouds, burnished a path of gold on the river. Above us, in the night's plush curtains, the silent applause of stars. And I'll dedicate this one to Melissa, my driver. <laughs> um, this is another ekphrastic poem. Um, in French, it's a vase de lila à la fenêtre, and in English, it's lilacs in a window. It's based on a Mary Cassatt painting. For years, you complained about them, our row of lilacs, because they were scanty when they bloomed, never enough to make you happy. So you cut them back hard, then everything terrible happened. Now they have returned, exuberant as this painting, pale violet, deep purple, frothy white, pouring their unmistakable scent all over the yard, that swoony perfume. The starry flowers, the heart-shaped leaves. I wish I could come through the kitchen door to you, 
One more time, arms full of lilacs, petals in my hair. I know you would dance me across the tiles, careful not to crush them. Oh, how we would twirl, wrapped in this heady fragrance, this perennial love. And another ekphrastic poem. This is based on a gelatin silver print by Brassai, Coupe d'Amoureux dans un petit café, Cartier Italie, or couple in a cafe hanging out. <laughs> this could have been us, maybe 70 years later on one of our trips to the City of Light. First, you'd wrestle with the top brass over the R&D budget while I shopped and went to museums. Then, when the business stress was over, it was just the two of us. No worries about my mother, our son with autism, just us, a small brasserie, the May air, the blossoming trees. Even the smoke from nearby Gitin, part of the ambiance. I love the way the coffee in France came avec son chocolat, with his chocolate, that sense of belonging. The couple in this photograph are just about to kiss. We never see the next moment when the bessie happens. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's a contrivance, a pose for the camera's eye. It doesn't matter now. But if it had been us, oh yes, we always followed through. <laughs> and we live in a, a, a neighborhood built in an old apple orchard. So that's been a part of our life in the past 45 years. I'm about to move, so it's just a little scary. Um, I have a quote by Louise Erdrich as the epigraph. You are here to risk your heart. You are here to be swallowed up. And when that happens, that you are broken or betrayed or left or hurt or death brushes near, let yourself sit by an apple tree and listen to the apples falling all around you in heaps, wasting their sweetness. Tell yourself you tasted as many as you could. Windfall. Those apples fall, thunk, thunk, bruising where they hit the ground, wasting their sweetness. You can cut out each brown spot, quarter and core them, cook them down until they soften, whirl them through the Foley food mill, separating out the bitter skin. Then add sugar, cinnamon, nutmeg, turn them into sauce. But what will soften this great loss? The grief therapist says time will slowly wear down the sharp edges, but I don't believe her. Every day without you is a knife to the heart. I think I'm moving forward, then trip and cut myself again. The ripe blood spooling out, shiny as a red delicious, hanging out of reach in the crooked branches of what's left in this orchard. And then I'm going to close with three poems from my new book, Slow Wreckage, um, which I do have copies with me. Um, the dual themes, woven themes in this book are slow wreckage, aging in the body, and climate change and the planet. It's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this um, is a sonnet. I, I don't normally work in form, but occasionally I do. And I have the quote, it's a famous quote from William Faulkner. The past is never dead. It's not even past. Then, oak leaves stamped against a chicory sky, swirled with clouds like a marble I once had and lost. It's probably still there, caught in a dry puddle, a tree root, or one of those cracked pavements of childhood that we walked on going to school. We roamed the neighborhood in feral packs, marked up the curb with chalk, hopscotch, marbles, kickball, only going in for food or band-aids, no sunscreen, helmets, fancy bikes. Once, 
We rode to the creek to swim, dead deer resting in the shallows. We didn't think alike, was it safe to swim or not? I can still hear my mother calling my name as darkness fell, and fireflies sent messages that only they could spell. We honestly spent an hour discussing, was it safe or not safe to swim in the water with a dead deer? <laughs> you shouldn't let us out. <laughs> 70th birthday. That evening, I sat at a table with a linen cloth, elegant cocktail of lemon vodka, champagne, elderflower liqueur, stars in my ears. Across from me, a man I still love, his silver hair glinting in the dim half light. I'm thinking of Jane Kenyon and how this could be otherwise, but it's not. I know later there'll be an empty chair, a cold bed, a life halved, but right now I have everything I need. The sun coming up tomorrow morning, the clouds, pink frosting, spreading all the way to the horizon. And then this is the last poem, but I just want to thank you so much for being such a lovely, lovely audience. Um, and one of the things that's going to be also really difficult for me to leave is my garden. I'm a gardener, and I'm going to move to an apartment with a balcony, but I could do pots, maybe. I don't know. I'll try. Credo. It's early summer, everything running to green, and the sun has dipped its brush in gilt. Cryopsis, black-eyed Susans, Stelladoro lilies. At night, the cool moon throws a silver net over the darkened yard. You can till the earth, hoe the rose, but each seed is an act of belief that somehow, in the dark, something is happening, seeds splitting their husks, softened by rain and spray from the hose, then sending up pale shoots, periscopes searching for light. Two leaves four leaves, then suddenly a vine, which has a mind of its own, trellising up the tomatoes, smothering the beans. Remove the coils used for a foothold, place it in the space between the rows so it can grow longer, greener every day. Nobody ever sees this happen. We take it on faith. Next come little lemon stars, then small green globes, which swell, fill, fuel by the sun. The calendar turns to August, days ripen, each one more golden than the next. Nothing the gardener does can make this happen. One morning, when the leaves are slick with dew, you go out to check and realize every rib is yellow, the netting is even, webbed with gold, and that which is held fast through this long season is ready to slip. Fill your hands with its heft. Fill your bowl with roundness, and soon, nestled in the boat of your spoon, the sun's longing exploding on your tongue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so we're about to wrap things up here. I just want to give everybody a reminder that uh, we are going to be partying outside uh, just for a little bit longer. I think they're having the food out there until 8.30, so make sure to grab some cheese before you go, um, or, or else I'm going to grab it all, and then tomorrow's going to be a hard day. Um, speaking of poet hunt, I do want to remind everyone that we are having another poet hunt that is happening right now. Uh, this year's contest runs like all the other ones, April 1st through June 15th. Send us five poems, 15 bucks, and we'll, uh, maybe one day you two can be a grand champion. Uh, 
Before I uh, kick it over to Brett Griffiths uh, for some closing statements, I just want to give one more shout out to my man, Stephen Goodrich, taking care of the video feed tonight. Thank you, Stephen. Everybody watching that live stream, get in that comment section and give my man Steven some props. All right, and closing it out today, we have, one more time, editor Brett Griffiths. Well, we said that I'm going to close it out, but the reality is, as we started, this journal started in 1984, and even though Art Lindbergh could not join us today live, or in person, I guess, he is live, and we're going to try to let him actually close this out. I do want to say thank you to everyone um, for being a great audience. I want to thank you, uh, Gordon, Kathleen, for bringing me into this family. Barbara, for telling me that your prize, one of your prize-winning poems was first rejected 25 times. Go home, write that in your journals. It's important. Art, let's try the sound. Mm -hmm. Hold on. We're going to try this. I'm not private. This was a very last-minute thing, guys. We're going to do our best. Thank you, Andressa. Can I hear you? Are you? We're not, we're not, nobody's muted. Oh, 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 here we go, here we go. Okay. Yeah. He was trying to go to my Bluetooth speakers. Okay, there we go. Hello, all this technology. Uh, when, when Brett, uh, when uh, Gordon showed you the uh, first issue of the MacGuffin, we didn't have any technology. Uh, we put that together with uh, an IBM's electric typewriter in a back room. And now we have all this, and it's wonderful. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, who's been a part of MacGuffin over these 40 years. It's just remarkable, and I'm gratified and humbled and honored uh, to have started this and to have seen it grow. Uh, I also want to mention here a person who should get more than one mention, and that's Steve Dolgen. Uh, when I retired, Steve took the journal over and uh, kept it alive and flourishing for 18 years. And uh, then it uh, still went on after that. So I want to thank Steve, and I want to thank all the people who've been part of the staff, uh, uh, Carol and uh, uh, Liz and all the other people who've been part of the staff, and thank all of you for supporting and uh, keeping this journal alive. Thanks again. Thank you, Art, and thank you, everybody. Have a great night and a safe drive home. Have one more glass of wine if it's in you, a little bit of cheese. Clean us out, guys. <laughs>